is the new business discussion, possible action on human animal support services, strategies for providing support services to community members. I wanted someone to come and present to us from either, either the APA. So I believe we have Ellen Jefferson on the line. And as what I usually do is allow six minutes for prisoners. So if that's okay, then uh, Ellen, if you're on, go ahead. Give me just a second. Welcome to the Audio Conferencing Center. Please enter a conference ID followed by pound. If you're the meeting organizer, press star now. Please wait for the leader to admit you. You're now joining the meeting. Okay. You've been muted. To unmute yourself, press star six. Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Hello? There she is. You're on. Go ahead. Speak. Hello, you're on. I hope. Oh my god. Hello? Dr. Jefferson? Can you can you hear me? Ellen? Ellen, can you hear us at all? Okay, the citizen line is okay. like. Sounds like you can hear me, so I'm just going to start talking. Um, I am Ellen Jefferson. I'm the executive director of Austin Pest Alive, and um, I'm going to fly through the slides that I sent as backup. And I don't know if you guys have them up or not because the video is not working on the website. So I'm just going to yell out the slide number and talk as I'm going. Um, so slide number two, in March, shelters emptied out in an in a effort to try to prevent COVID from spreading to people. And what came of that is right that uh, so many more fosters right. came forward all across the country that there was really this epiphany that there's so many people out there that want to help. And, um, and so slide number three, in fact, even over the last That's few months and after the COVID right. push of fosters out to foster homes, um, there's been 80,000 more people signing up and only 30,000 of those homes got used across the country. And that's just one national org collecting foster names. Slide number four, because of that, the shelter industry had some time to think about sheltering in general, especially the history. Slide number five, in Austin, the shelter was created because of a pandemic rabies. And um, back then, police would shoot dogs on site, and people got mad. This was the late 1800s, 1900s. So the shelter was actually created to house dogs for three days and then shoot them to prevent people from getting mad. The animals that got out only got out because their owners could afford to pay for them for their license, and they, were, they had accessibility to the shelter. Um, slide number seven, our history is all around us. Even now, the shelter is an institution. Institutions like this in other sectors have been eradicated due to welfare concerns. Slide number eight, in Austin, those concerns go back 80 plus years. Slide number nine, as late as the 60s and 70s, police still ran animal control. Slide number 10, uh, it's important to understand that areas with COVID outbreaks in Austin closely resemble the areas of very high intake. Slide number 11, in addition, we know that millions have lost their jobs and millions more will lose their jobs. Slide number 12, we know there's also going to be massive evictions happening soon. And um, once they start, actually some of them have started, once they start, they're going to continue for months, maybe years. 
slide number 13, that's important because the lack of financial ability to pay medical bills on animals, housing, and finance, financial reasons in general are the top three reasons that animals are surrendered to shelters. Slide number 14, as a result of all those previous slides, the industry is realizing it has to change. Slide number 15, that has spurred the Human Animal Support Services Project. Slide number 16, it was created for three reasons. One, to prevent gatherings and prevent the spread of COVID to people. And so by preventing uh, gatherings of animals. Uh, number two is to um, prepare for mass increase in, um, in animal needs by creating programs that are scalable. And, and the third reason is that there is a foundation of inequity and in sheltering that needs to be undone. Slide number 17, um, I'm sorry, let me get to my slide number 17. So HOS will foundationally transform animal sheltering into the community-based support and services that value all humans, all animals, and their bond. Slide number 18, the mission of HOS is to bring people together from all over the, all sectors in the industry, collaborate and build the model together, pilot it in prominent cities throughout the country, evaluate success, and iterate the process more widely. Slide number 19, the project will work by bringing 18 tier one communities together who have all agreed to build and pilot the HOS program together over the next 12 months. Another 20 tier two communities will follow the lead of tier one. We have over 200 individuals, including some um, very prominent industry experts working on 35 working groups to solve longstanding industry problems that prevent progress. And the it, we will build out at least five programs that will help to drive the movement. One is rehoming without the use of a shelter kennel, lost and found services without using the shelter kennel, keeping pets with family by providing medical and behavioral support for people that want to keep their animal, and public safety reimagined to make sure that we're not dropping the ball on public safety, and intake to placement ASAP for the animals that do need to enter the shelter, which we know there's going to be animals that do, making sure they have an exit route planned immediately. Slide number 20, the list, this is the list of cities that are pilot, um, pilot communities, tier one and tier two. There are, and I should say those are all municipal um, government funded facilities. Slide number 21, there are 35 working groups to overcome the industry obstacles. And you can see it's a myriad of different topics that they're trying to solve for. We're building the movement and the model at the same time because this is an immense, um, a, an immense change and an immense opportunity, and we need to make sure that we're getting it right. Uh, the slide number 23 is a, a schematic that shows kind of the current system in every, every city in America, but we're specifically talking about Austin, that um, there's a central place where most of the activity that occurs in animal services occurs. And people have to access that place, either by the telephone or coming in, and a lot of the work is done in person. There are a few people that are out in the community, like the neighborhood level programming um, officers, and, um, but for the most part, most of the care and services occur in the shelter. In the new system, what we're looking at, which is slide number 24, we're looking at actually creating a um, case management system where people can contact the shelter and work through someone to help them triage their problem and, um, and then access services that will be built with the HOSP programming to be able to support whatever the need is in the community. And that might be boarding an animal as an owner goes to rehab, et cetera. Um, slide number 25, I'm just gonna read these really important points. Um, HOSP is not leaving animals on the street to die. HOSP is not forcing people to be part of the network of support. HOSP is not preventing animals from entering the shelter who really need to be there. HOSP is not a sudden beginning. HOSP is providing case management to find the right pathway for each individual animal and person. HOSP is creating a network of community fosters who are able to accept animals instead of putting them in the shelter kennel. HOSP is sheltering animals who have no other legitimate option. And HOSP is a transition. As programs are built, animals and people use those programs, not before. And slide number 26 just shows that this is an iterative process. And slide number 27 um, is uh, just trying to highlight the fact that this, uh, there is a, a lot of um, concern around intake. And the HOSP model actually solves for that intake by keeping pets safe both in and out of the shelter. 
Uh, slide number 28, why Austin? It's the right thing to do. And as far as I know, we have no other plan to handle the impending doom, as I like to call it. Slide number 29, um, we really can't wait. There are opportunities being lost every day by Austin not being part of this amazing group of individuals and communities and shelter directors that are all making tremendous change for the positive. Slide number 30, uh, we are asking, we're asking the commission to recommend to council to pass a resolution to align animal services operations in Austin with human animal support services and join the Haas project. And that's it. And I, I don't think I can actually hear anybody or anything, so um, I'm not sure what to do. Well, obviously she can't take any questions, so uh, we'll move on to any motions and discussion. Um, I have a, a few concerns, quick concerns to express. Go ahead, Joanne. Sorry, Andrea can go first. I, I just had a question about the motion. Yes, I just, can you hear me? Can you folks hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I just have a few concerns to express. Uh, right now, people have a lot more free time to foster uh, during this pandemic. It's a unique temporary situation. Um, and we just really can't assume that people will continue to have as much free time after COVID-19 or that 50 to 90% of animals will go to foster. In fact, um, according to a recent Best Friends Town Hall video discussing their 2019 data set, quote, despite the sharp increase of pets in foster care at the beginning of the crisis, cat foster starts were lower throughout April and May than in 2019, than in 2019 sorry, and dog foster starts returned to 2019 levels by the end of April, unquote. This shows that the foster rush at the beginning of COVID-19 has leveled off. And I believe it's problematic to create a potentially permanent shelter model based on a temporary situation. And one more concern, uh, I live in District 3 I, and I represent District 1, uh, both east side underserved uh, communities. The 311 data shows that most loose dogs come from uh, Districts 1, 2, and 3, predominantly people of color. I don't see the infrastructure and resources in place for the Haas model to deal with this. Underserved East Austin communities do not have Wi-Fi access as much as more privileged ones do. So there's a lack of technological infrastructure creating a digital divide. Um, in fact, AISD recently realized that many Eastside kids couldn't do their schoolwork online due to lack of Wi-Fi. So they park school buses as internet hotspots to help. The map of the Wi-Fi buses aligns with the 311 loose dog calls. And the broadband divide extends way past Austin. CBS News recently reported that nearly half of Americans either have very slow internet or none at all. Um, last point, also the, the city anticipates a very tight budget for years to come. So who is going to field the needs of the 14,000 strays that came in last year when each is supposed to have a Haas counselor? Many of my East Austin neighbors think that Haas is unfeasible and will ultimately put the burden on them. And I, and I share that concern. Thank you. Okay, uh, Joanna, just give me a second. Uh, uh, city guys, do we have any extra time since uh, we had to reboot a couple times, kind of like in soccer injury time? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say uh, we got a little bit longer. Um, I'll probably have to cut you off right at five though if we go to that point. Okay, hopefully we won't. Uh, go ahead, Joanna. I mean, Joanna, I'm sorry. Okay, um, thank you. Um, well, I guess Dr. Jefferson can ask, answer questions, so I'll, um, um, Mr. Bland, uh, if you can answer what you can. Um, I have some concerns about Haas. I'm glad we're thinking outside the box, and I appreciate the work that the city's doing to think outside the box that uh, Mark Sloat did, and I know what Brendan does um, with the community. But just a couple of questions. Um, one, in a handout that Dr. Jefferson sent us um, for the last meeting, um, a part of Haas is this community vet service where people can call in and get telemedicine. But I looked at the site of the Texas Veterinary Board, and 
that's against their rules. Um, their rules are real specific that you have to know a pet in order to do telemedicine with a pet. So um, is Mr. Blaine, is there a, a shelter rule that says we don't have to comply with the Texas Vet Board? No, and our, our head vet is here and she can attest to that. Uh, they can't work on unowned animals from this, in, in terms of, they can't work on owned animals that aren't here in the shelter that belong to us. So she, someone off the street just couldn't bring in their own personal animal and she could treat it. Um, is that correct? Correct. Correct. You can't diagnose all the animals. So we're doing telemedicine with the shelter, but we send these animals in a WCAT to make that Okay. So, okay. Go ahead. Okay. So that sounds correct in what the vet board's posting. So that um, doesn't work in Texas. Um, the idea of the hotline concerns me because I know that there's a delay now in trying to reach people and to try to make foster appointments and try to make adoption appointments just because of staffing and because of the records that need to be kept by the city. Um, so what type of, is this even doable for you or what type of, of burden would that put on the city to have to um, provide um, instant chats and instant uh, uh, response to people that's in the documents? It, we, we would have to have staffing to be able to do that. Uh, even shifting some staffing, we wouldn't have enough uh, people because you have to understand how many emails and calls we get every day currently. And it's not just one. Someone will email us and then they'll do three or four follow up emails that just compound the situation. So, um, you know, the unknown. Yeah, we definitely, I mean, if we were to see a proposal, we'd have to do sort of a staff assessment just to, just to fulfill a, a uh, what the financial impact might be. Okay. Um, and, but right now there's no budget for case managers, live chats, hotlines. No. no. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Um, a couple of people have brought up the issue of um, diseases, rabies, distemper. If we go to a model where someone finds the animal and then they're told, well, here, you can just hang on to the animal um, and then we'll try to, because um, you're in the community, and then we'll try to get you to get the animal adopted. Who's responsible for making sure those animals have um, vaccinations and are spay and neutered? Not really. Not sure. Uh, yeah, it's probably questions we can't ask of. Yeah, those, those would be the Haas questions that I couldn't answer. And there's no one here to answer them? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, let me try to go through the ones that aren't specific to Haas since I can't ask those. Um, Um, so can you sum up the reason why the city has declined being in the pilot? And it's not just you, but Assistant City Manager Shorter has declined. He's been contacted by APA. Um, the mayor was contacted. It still hasn't happened. Um, can you kind of explain why you don't maybe down the road want to participate in HASP, but why you're reluctant to be part of the pilot? Okay. Um, one of the things that the city is, I guess their, their model is they, they in, embrace the community and have those conversations with the community before they make any major changes. And they, that's one of the things they would want to do. They would want to have community input. They would want to have, you know, talks with the, the stakeholders and, and let them be a part of the situation and, and you know, put, put them 
in the mix uh, and, and get data on that. You know, one of the things that uh, Dr. Jefferson mentioned on one of her slides, on the one that said how we get there, she talked about rehoming without using the shelter and lost and found pets without using the shelter. Well, that's exactly what we did at the beginning of our shutdown as we were telling people, you know, if, if you find a pet, go knock on the doors and rehome it. Uh, if, if you can keep it, keep it. Uh, if, and, you know, lost and found, help it get home. Uh, all of those things that, that we were getting blasted for because we were doing it that way. You saw the uprising and the swell from the public when we just implemented two of these things at the very beginning. And so, and, and most of it was because they didn't have any input. So getting the, the, the community to have input and, and have these discussions and buy-in is something that the city feels very strongly that needs to go happen going forward. Because you know you, we saw the repercussions when we started some of this without their knowledge. And that was because we, you know, we had to shut the shelter down for human factors mm -hmm. and safety. And I know from the, mess, the um, emails we've been getting from citizens and the phone calls, they're very, very concerned about intake. And I think that's a concern of mine. And um, I noticed, uh, I checked again today, and El Paso, who's one of the Haas pilots, is still not taking in, um, it seems, healthy animals. There's, uh, they specifically say if your animal is injured or needs medical care or there's some other issue, you can call, but it doesn't look like they're doing healthy animals and we want to make sure we don't lose that momentum since I know you're taking some because I know the shelter is filling up more um, than it was. Um, so um, back to the legal issue, I know in Texas the property laws are kind of with animals are kind of murky and as the impounding authority if an animal comes through the shelter it's posted um, then you can legally adopt it out but if someone just finds an animal and posts on next door, posts on Craigslist, they don't hear anything, does that count toward that and they can legally give that, adopt out that animal? Or can someone later on come back and claim that that was their animal and they should get it back? Uh, in, in Texas, and there was a case out of Houston that if, if they would have to give that animal back if the owner came back and said, you have my animal. Essentially, the way the findings of that case was, I believe they, they found that the court found that an owner doesn't actually relinquish its rights completely altogether on an animal if it, if it ends up going as lost or stray. I think without that formal documentation of an impound or an owner surrender, um, yeah, uh, it, the court proved that you know, the owner doesn't technically relinquish all of its right, all of their rights. Okay. And another kind of legal question, if you get a foster for a dog and the foster follows all the rules, but something happens, say the dog gets loose and the dog bites somebody unexpectedly, I think the shelter will cover the cost for that. But if someone is told, well, just hang on to the dog and then uh, we'll try to rehome it and the dog say, bite somebody, who's liable for that? I'm not an attorney. I wouldn't know, but I would assume that the person that had the dog. Okay. But it wouldn't be the city. The city wouldn't say, oh, well. Because we didn't take Because it never came through you. No, correct. Okay. Um, hey, Joanne? Yeah. Would you, I know you have more questions. Would you yield? And then we can come back to you if we have time. So somebody else can go. Um, well, um, I could. I, I guess my concern with questions, and I, I, had, I assumed Dr. Jefferson would be on, is that um, if we make a motion for this to, to do this document, I mean, we're really making a motion saying we want to have council override the city's decision. And so I think it's important to just have the questions answered. So I'm trying to limit what I can, but I'll yield. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to get back to you. Who, who had their hand up next? Was it uh, Nancy? Was it you or uh, Ryan? Ryan, go ahead. Um, I, I'm not ready to, to talk yet. I wanted to listen to everybody, but I did want to just answer a couple of the legal questions because I think they matter. Um, 
with respect to um, telemedicine, and one of the questions was, could could veterinary practice um, could the, could veterinary uh, skills be practiced over telemedicine? And um, the occupations code con uh, contains the veterinary uh, pra practice act, um, and telemedicine, it's true, is one of the things that is not allowed without uh, an existing relationship with the owner. However, the Veterinary Practice Act, right on top, the, one of the very first, first provisions on top says it does not apply uh, to uh, the owner of an animal or a designated caretaker. So I do think there's some legal issues that would have to be resolved that I don't think are resolved simply in the general um, information that we've been provided, but, I, but that's not saying that it couldn't be. I just don't think that it has been resolved um, yet. Um, same thing with the, um, I think there was the references made to um, ownership not being able to be transferred. The, the case that they're talking about is the German Shepherd Rescue, um, I forgot the party on the, party on the other side. Um, the case did not say what is being represented that it said. What, what it said is that uh, ownership does not transfer simply by the, the existence of a hold period and the expiration of a hold period, that ownership would transfer uh, in the event that the cities um, or, music, or counties, whatever municipality it was, their ordinance um, expressly stated that ownership would be transferred at the end of the hold period. So it's not, it's not simply that your ownership rights outlast uh, the hold period is that the hold period of ordinance has to make clear that your ownership would transfer. So again, these are issues that I don't think we can resolve today. I'm not sure we even have a motion on the table. Um, I do think that they are resolvable issues, but uh, but it's not. Um, it is not a prohibition. There's no legal prohibition on what's being uh, discussed. However, I do think we would have to sort through it in our ordinances. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Would we sort through it? it, it I'm sorry. Um, would we sort through it in ordinances or would it be part of, do you know if it would be, oh, I guess you wouldn't know if it would be just be part of all the Haas discussion? I think, I mean, one or the other. It would require an order. This is my opinion. I am a lawyer and I have given CLEs on these two subjects. Um, and I believe that it would what we are discussing would require some ordinance changes um, from a legal perspective. Uh, I do think the city is right that if uh, it was all private and it did not involve the city, uh, the city would have um, no liability um, to the extent that an animal was hurt uh, or someone was hurt by an animal um, in someone's care. But if we change the ordinances, so that this became part of the city's program, that that could be that could really lead to a different result. result. All of this is I'm just trying to say these are resolvable issues, but they are not resolved simply by the presentation that was given. We we would have to work through it, and I think the city council would expect us to work through it. Okay, thank you. Who was next? Anyone? Let um, me ask this. David, uh, I have a question. Oh, Sorry. Go ahead, Edward. Go ahead, Edward. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Joanne, um, all of your, everything you had, all your questions were exactly the questions I had. So I appreciate you asking them. I really do wish we had uh, Dr. Jefferson on the phone so that we could ask those. Um, so that's that's really all I want to say as I echo exactly the concerns that Joanne had. Um, to Don, I know I'm going to go back on this, but uh, you had a specific or uh mr bland sorry um you had a specific you wanted instances of when people were told to buy three and one to release the dog back i do have a phone number of a person that was told that that i have been uh in contact with during this meeting and they said they are 100 percent sure it was said and they'd be happy to give their phone number to you to express to 311 so that they could pull up that call um, so that's I can give perfect. I will I will send that to you um, yeah. through email. So or, or through Belinda. Um, that that was all, David. Uh, like I said, Joanne did echo all of my concerns as well. Uh, so I I again wish we had Dr. Jefferson on so that we could at least get some answers to these. 
Craig. Uh, yeah, I think this is a very complex issue. I think that, first of all, we need to uh, look at, at doing a better job. And it's not that we're doing a bad job. It's that the pandemic and a whole lot of other things have shown that this is our no-kill shelter is a work in process. And there are things that still aren't working as well as they could. I think that the Haas program shows potential in some areas. I think there's some areas we still need to get more information. And I really think, it, once again, it would really be good to have Ellen Jefferson here to, to help us out. And I also would agree with Ryan that we need to look at some of these legal issues. I think they're very important if we expect this to work. So um, I would not just saying right now, I would not want to vote on anything today on this. I think this is a very good session, but we need to talk about this more. And maybe uh, at another meeting uh, soon, uh, we can have Ellen Jefferson there where we can ask her some of these questions that I think are very important that we need to hear her answers to. Well, well let me ask, is, is anyone pre uh, prepared to uh, pony up a motion at this time? Can um, I would make a motion? <laughs> I make a motion to postpone voting on Haas until the next meeting. So that was a motion to to postpone Haas and any any action on Haas till the next meeting. Uh, and that was a second by Joanne. Um, Um, any discussion from anyone else, Ryan? Uh, I just would like I'm I, I'm valuing everyone's comments, and to the extent this motion would would prevent the other commissioners from asking questions and discussing, I would be against it. Um, I'm fine with I, I'm fine with postponing, but I really appreciate the input and the questions and the comments from the other commissioners before we postpone. So I would vote against the motion to postpone now because I would like to not cut off the rest of the commissioners. Uh, Palmer? Yeah, um, I would like to just, I know we're no, we don't have a motion on the table, but if we do, there is a motion to postpone this. I would well, like the motion to is to postpone we, right now. So. Well, I would like to ask that we schedule another meeting soon to finish the discussion on this because I think things are going to be changing and changing quickly. And I feel like that, that we need to finish this discussion if it's not finished today. Um, yeah, I agree on that. I'll, I'll just I'll say my position on the on the AHAS is I'm I'm in, intrigued. I know, I know there are a lot of questions. Um, my council office has contacted me, and they're interested. So uh, if they're interested, I'm interested. Um, so I would probably vote on. You know, some some motion for for running because of that and that alone. Um, but we do need to uh, vote on the motion to postpone. Um, so I'm just going to run. I'm going to run down uh, like we did the roll call. Um, I'm a no. Uh, Katie, this is a motion to post postpone till next meeting. Um, I'm a no. Uh, Palmer. I'm a no. Nancy. I'm a no. Uh, Edward. So just a uh, quick, so this is, the, the no's are to not postpone or to postpone? The no's are to not postpone. Uh, I, I vote to postpone. I didn't hear you. Did you say? Uh, yeah, uh, I vote to postpone until the next meeting. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Andrea. I vote to postpone. Joanne. Um, I vote to postpone. Brian. Uh, at this time, before the commissioners have weighed in and asked questions, I would vote against the motion to postpone because I think the commissioners should be able to weigh in on that issue. Mm -hmm. 
Did I miss anybody? Well, uh, motion needs seven votes, so that, that fails. Um, we can continue discussion for a few more minutes. Uh, does anybody want to talk on the, the actual merits of uh, recommending pass, or does anybody want to speak again on uh, against it? If not, we're going to need another motion. Or Ryan. Uh, sorry, can I ask one more question? If no one else has one. Excuse me, we missed a vote. We did not get Craig's vote on the motion. Oh, okay. Well, that's what I was asking. Okay, thank you. Craig, what was your vote? Craig? I agree with Ryan. I vote no. Okay, I'm sorry. So that was three yeas and six noes. Okay, uh, Joanne, you had another question? And then uh, Ryan? Oh, um, th for the city, uh, um, a lot of ha seems to involve um, a lot of changes with uh, involving IT. And you've mentioned in some of the earlier talks that um, we've had some issues with, uh, not issues, but it takes a while for IT because they're so involved in all these other things. Um, do you see trying to implement, uh, for HAAS implementation for a pilot, um, that IT would be difficult to um, coordinate? Well, we recently had to send a um, memo to council because we missed the deadline on the 16 reports that the new, the last ordinance required us to give. And I know Monica mentioned one by breaking down by species on euthanization. That is something that we had to send them because we couldn't accomplish that. Uh, our IT person that was assigned to us uh, left the department and right, right as the COVID shutdown was happening and those reports have just been out there in queue uh, till they get to work on them. So that, yes, we are limited on to what we can get IT to do for us. Brian? Thank you, David. Um, I guess that I wanted to uh, speak to Haas, and, and first of all, I, I absolutely hear all of the objections, and I think that they're valid, and um, I, I am listening. I'm, this was more of a listening session for me than, any, than anything, and I appreciate everyone weighing in. Um, I think that these voices are important. I also want to thank a number of people who emailed us with very specific concerns. The, the petition emails are unhelpful when we see the same thing, same exact language 50 times, but for the folks who spent the time to email us and have backup materials and were really thoughtful, I don't know if they can hear us, but I want to say thank you for the people that did. Um, I read them and they're valuable and insightful and helpful. Um, I, uh, I am absolutely in favor in the theory of Haas as I understand it, which is a services-based model um, so that um, we treat animal services like a family service, or at least that's the way I understand it. And, and I want to confess that I don't know that I understand it completely. But as I understand it, I understand it to be an animal service or a family services type model where we are going to attempt to instantaneously provide the services to people rather than putting them off for several weeks or even months as we have um, at times done currently. Whereas, you know, as, as, as of now, someone in with a, with a, you know, they want to spend their own animal but on a several week long wait list. Whereas my understanding us would instantaneously provide them with some services. Obviously that is a better model um, to instantaneously provide services to people to try to solve problems that they have, um, to, to try to um, provide them with materials or food or medical service or what it is, whatever it is, solve their problem rather than having to just hold on for six weeks. Um, we don't know what's happening during that six weeks. We don't know what those people are going through or what that animal is going through. So I'm 100% behind what I understand the model to be. Um, which is a service model where we provide those services immediately and effectively to people. I do want to make clear that I would not vote for a host model with any of this mandatory for 
uh, the citizen. Um, for a citizen who finds a stray animal, uh, it, in, in my mind, has to be 100% volunteer. Understanding that that's what the Haas model is, but we have been providing backup materials from uh, citizens that at least somewhat indicate that that's not true. So, um, again, it's hard to, to, I think that probably could have been answered by Dr. Jefferson if she were on the phone. Um, I don't know whether those materials are even accurate, um, but that it said, and I, I did read our emails and took those concerns very seriously. So for me, I would not support us unless it was voluntary or the person who's being asked to provide that service. And, you know, with respect to the, um, the concern that this would be uh, hard on citizens in, in lower income communities, again, it's my understanding that this is the opposite of that, that this is a trying, this is attempt to provide services to persons in lower income communities who would never have these services before. Um, again, asking for in a low income community to wait just six weeks to do something, that is not a provision of service. But we can instantaneously provide them over the phone. Again, it wouldn't have to be Wi Fi or, or a chat, it could be over the phone too. So I'm in favor of the model in theory as I understand it. Um, there, the issues that have been brought up are valid and important and things that I would that I believe we would have to work through, including the legal issues. I don't think tomorrow that we would have, um, that the city could do it uh, legally tomorrow without some ordinance. That's my opinion, I may be wrong about that. So uh, I'm not sure what I want to propose or if there's something that someone has in mind. I love the theory. I do think there are things that we have to work through and I'll let somebody else talk. Here's my everybody. I don't think that we have enough votes to really pass anything at this time. That's my thought. Um, you know, there's only nine people here, and um, we have the refusal. Uh, I will entertain the up and down uh, vote if anybody wants to make one. But my my recommendation would be um, buying some time by by forming a, a really quick work group that could meet outside the parameters of this awful system. No offense, city. Um, and then uh, maybe, you know, get a meeting, you know, early next month or whenever we can and, and try to answer some of these questions. And um, I mean, I would, like I said, I would, I, I share the same intrigue and concerns as has been presented here this afternoon. Um, I would, I would be a yes on exploring it. But um, my thought is that it's not feasible, and I would suggest buying time with, with the work group. But I'll entertain any motion anyone has. So, uh, I would make a motion to form a house work group um, to look at the questions that we have so we can um, come back and inform the commission and we can make the right decision to recommend to council. I know it's a little wordy, but maybe you can help me with it. Um, I second that. I second I say, it. Okay. okay. I, I would say a motion by Joanne to form a house work group, period. Seconded okay. by Craig. Uh, discussion. Uh, I will say that yeah, Ryan. I just want to make sure that everybody has had a chance to talk about what they want to talk about uh, before we vote on anything. If there's anybody else, I would encourage you to chime in on this, even uh, even though there's a motion with whatever you guys wanted to talk about. Can, can you hear me? Um, I, all I will say is that I, I think that, you know, a lot of the questions that were asked probably do have uh, a response. And I have a lot of questions for Dr. Jefferson and questions about how the other 30 cities that have implemented costs, um, how it's playing out there in these early stages. So I, I guess my question is how soon can we get Dr. Jefferson back in front of us to kind of go through some of these two names.
Um, you were breaking up. You want to, you asked what how soon we get Ellen back to this body on this meeting. I, right. So that the entire you know, commission is all of the commissioners are able to ask these questions instead of just a single party and have her kind of talk about not only the questions we have related to Austin, but how this is working in the other 30 plus cities that have implemented it. Yeah. Well, the options would be the, the options would be wait until September or to ask if I'm allowed to call another special, which I could do in a couple of weeks, I guess, depending on the governor's restrictions and the mayor's restrictions. Ryan? Are we allowed to, as a body, vote to have a regular meeting that is not your calling a special? That's an excellent question. Um, I've always read that the chair can call a special meeting. I, I, I imagine there's probably, I would have to look at the bylaws to answer that question. There might be, um, but, you know, I would, I don't think that'd be necessary because I would call one as soon as we, as y'all wanted it, you know, just, I'd have to get with uh, Linda and get, see if we could get, get another time, not on a Friday. Um, But yes, I mean, I, I just need to make sure, sure you know, the legalities of, of calling a, a special meeting and uh, the availability of time slots and, you know, just due to the whole uh, COVID thing. But I, I, I would be amenable to calling one as soon as possible. So that answers your question. Chair, right. this is Stephanie at City Hall. I'm sorry for the interruption, but I just wanted to let you know that we are going to lose AV support in about two minutes, so we do need to wrap up this meeting. I can also speak to the special called. Right now, we are suspending your limits on having a special called meeting, so you can certainly have one. However, the problem is time slots. So I would love to get you in as soon as we can, but we are really limited on when we can do that. So, But you can absolutely have another meeting until these waivers are lifted. Brian? I support the motion. I'm going to stop talking. Okay. Uh, so motion to form the work group. Everybody, I think everybody just say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Opposed? Okay, so that, that, okay, motion carries. Um, in the brief time that we have left, 